Hello, this is David Hall, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, Gigabit Class Cellular IoT is Here, Paving the Way to 5G, presented by the IoT M2M Council and sponsored by TELIT. Since its establishment in 2013, over 25,000 adopter members have joined the IoT M2M Council, which has focused on making the implementation of IoT and M2M solutions simpler, faster, and more profitable for its member base. If you are not a member, please consider joining by applying on our website, iotm2mcouncil.org. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes long, followed by a 15-minute Q&A session with our presenter. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All of the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. Uh, the webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or your headset are turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear the presenter. If your slides are delayed, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately 24 hours after the broadcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar presenter, Marco Argentan, Head of uh, Europe, Middle East, and Asia Product Marketing at TELIT. Welcome, Marco. Hello. Thank you, David. I hope that you can uh, hear my voice uh, well. And um, it's uh, my pleasure for, for being here. And uh, thanks also to all the people that uh, joined uh, live uh, this, uh, this webinar. And uh, thanks also in advance to everybody who will uh, listen to, to the recording uh, of, uh, of this session. So I will try to uh, guide you through this uh, topic. And uh, the DLT gigabit, uh, what is it, uh, why is it uh, important, uh, and uh, which is the relation with uh, 5G? Because sometimes uh, the risk uh, is to misunderstand or at least to, to overlap uh, the two topics, uh, in particular if the only metric that we have is the data throughput. So let me start uh, uh, from uh, this uh, uh, article, okay, uh, just to give a little bit of, uh, of background. Uh, if we want to talk about 5G, I think uh, is, uh, is relevant to mention what happened a few uh, months ago. We are in May already. This article is dated uh, February and talking about the Winter Olympics in, uh, in Korea. Why uh, I'm referring to this event? Well, uh, it has been an important uh, event for the telecommunication industry uh, because it was expected to be the first uh, milestone uh, for a first public uh, 5G deployment. And um, this really happened. Uh, so uh, mission achieved, uh, even if telling the truth, uh, if we look in the technical details, we might uh, discover that it was more a pre-standard uh, proof of concept rather than a real uh, full 5G uh, deployment. But uh, we are not here to discuss or judge uh, how this has been done or implemented. Uh, for sure, it has been an important milestone uh, for our industry anyway. But the other important aspect, uh, as you can read uh, from the last uh, statement uh, of this snapshot, is that uh, 5G is not just about uh, fast networks, uh, but uh, is also about IoT in general. And this is something that we should uh, keep in mind, uh, because it's not just about uh, uh, high data rate, uh, but is also about uh, massive IoT deployments in the, in the future. So. Let's see which is the impact and how it could change the ecosystem. Uh, today, we have to admit that we are all struggling with different technologies in different regions and for different applications. 
and often the applications are forced to use a technology that is uh, overkill or, on the contrary, not enough to fulfill all the requirements. And uh, the general idea is that uh, 5G could be, uh, let's say, a kind of bigger umbrella covering all the different use cases. And also, why not uh, uh, able to open new opportunities? So on one side, uh, we will have uh, the massive IoT. Uh, characterized by cheaper devices, uh, solutions uh, capable of uh, staying in the field for 10 plus years uh, with a simple uh, battery supply, power supply, um, having the possibility of uh, more than 100,000 devices per cell, and, uh, and each of these devices uh, able to uh, have a, a good coverage also in extreme conditions. But uh, on the other side, uh, we have also the so-called mission critical applications. Uh, so uh, when, we, when I say mission critical, actually I'm not referring only to something uh, related to high speed, uh, and therefore requiring enhanced broadband uh, capabilities, but also to everything that is related to low latency and high reliability. So in a nutshell, we can, uh, for example, identify uh, the smart cities for the massive IoT and uh, uh, the autonomous vehicles for the mission critical applications, just to mention two examples and to, uh, to put uh, these uh, features in perspective. And uh, uh, these aspects mean also that uh, 5G uh, will enable critical machine type communication use cases, such as, uh, as I said, autonomous vehicles, but also, I don't know, cellular connected drones or real-time healthcare, and you name it. But uh, uh, as I said before, uh, there are uh, multiple problems and, and challenges. And uh, one of today's major challenges is that uh, the technology uh, often does not fit uh, for purpose. So uh, to be a bit more uh, precise, uh, 5G will not uh, embrace only massive IoT and mission critical application. It will embrace several aspects and different requirements in, uh, uh, let's say, three major scenarios. And these are the scenarios that I uh, tried to capture in this uh, graph. So on one side, we have the massive content, so everything that is related to the use case of speed, high speed gigabit or even more. So everything that can be called extreme or enhanced the mobile broadband. Then we have uh, uh, the uh, UMTC, so the, the massive control uh, for ultra-reliable MTC applications. And this is the use case of low latency uh, response uh, below the millisecond. And then we have uh, the massive uh, sensing. So this is uh, what uh, we are more familiar with nowadays. So the, the massive IoT, uh, the expectation of uh, a lot of devices in the field in the future, battery powered and, uh, and very low cost and, and uh, low power consumption. Uh, so I think that now it's clear that uh, 5G radio interface is capable to deliver ultra high speed and millisecond grade latency, but these features are not necessary for a lot of uh, IoT applications in the ecosystem. And uh, this is why there should be no confusion. Also, if we talk about uh, uh, LPWA, so uh, low power wide area technologies, also this is paving the way to 5G. As a matter of fact, uh, the technology CATM1 or narrowband IoT are the candidates to be submitted to meet the IMT 2020 requirements and to define the so-called 5G IoT. But uh, today we are here to talk about uh, one in particular of these three pillars, the one on the left, the one related uh, to massive content. So uh, let's see how to address this, uh, this use case with LT Gigabit even before uh, having 5G deploy deployment in place, because there will be the possibility in the next slide to, to see something also about the schedule and timing. Uh, 5G will happen for sure, but uh, nowadays we have, uh, we have LTE gigabit uh, opportunities, and uh, this webinar is exactly to, to discover uh, a little bit more about this. But before going to the uh, technicalities, I'd like to hand over back to, to David, 
for a poll question. Thank you, Marco. Uh, we have a, a question for our audience. Um, please feel free to, to mark the answer to your question on your screen. The question is, what is the status of your high-speed cellular technology application? Are you just starting to investigate? Have you recently launched an application with uh, lower L speeds, not thinking about upgrading quite yet? Or do you have an application that you want to upgrade to gigabit speeds now? Or are you going to wait for 5G? So please take the next few moments to um, mark your answer on, on the screen and click Submit so that uh, we can see the results in, in a moment. So I think um, we don't need to wait too long on this, so we can take a look at the results. And Marco, maybe you want to uh, comment on, on them a little bit. Yes, uh, I can see. So we have uh, the majority that is just uh, starting the investigation. And then we have uh, uh, a the lower percentage of uh, uh, answers on the um, application that requires an upgrade to gigabit, and then a good number also of uh, people that are waiting for 5G. So uh, first of all, let me say that uh, for the majority of the audience that is just uh, starting the investigation, I hope to be able to share some uh, relevant content uh, today, and uh, if not today, uh, I hope that we can get in contact in the next future to, to go deeper in details on how TELIT can support you on this. Um, and the same is valid uh, for those that are uh, requiring uh, uh, an upgrade. Of course, uh, there is not much to say about uh, those that are not thinking to upgrade yet, because uh, as I said before, uh, one technology does not fit uh, all the possible applications, so uh, we are well aware of some LTE categories uh, that are uh, already achieving uh, uh, enough throughput, for, for example, if we want to talk about throughput, uh, uh, for uh, several IoT use cases, so that's fine. Uh, one, um, um, one comment on the last results uh, for those that are uh, waiting for, for 5G. Well, uh, I would say that uh, it depends. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, typically don't force anybody to move to a technology if they don't feel comfortable. Uh, but if we look at it from a technical uh, perspective, uh, there are no uh, real reason to wait for it, uh, in my opinion, because uh, if we look at uh, the performance and the user experience, uh, as we will see today, the LT gigabit uh, uh, can deliver a seamless experience of, uh, of 5G. Uh, if instead the reason is uh, to wait uh, for a more mature ecosystem or to see how the, the operators will deploy the, the next technology and wait for mature devices, of course, this is a, an understandable position. And uh, uh, there is no hurry to, to go there. But if it is just for uh, technical features, uh, 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 I hope to be able to, to prove that uh, there is something we can do with LT Gigabit nowadays without waiting for 5G. Okay, so uh, let's move forward. And uh, thank you, by the way, for, for answering these, uh, these questions. It's always interesting to see which is the, the, the feedback from the audience in, in real time. Uh, so there is it for uh, for gigabit LTE. So what it takes to get uh, this high speed uh, performance? Uh, we talked about 5G. Uh, I just said that 5G is not there yet. Someone will wait for it. We will see later, which could be the uh, timing for for this. Um, but if the need is now and we have to address it, uh, let's see uh, what it takes. Well, uh, first of all. LT gigabit is really here now and, uh, and is really delivering a seamless uh, 5G mobile experience, as I just said. And there are, um, uh, and let's say this is a significant milestone on the road to 5G, because uh, by offering gigabit per second download, uh, download speeds, uh, 
the operators can meet the rising expectation of network performance and uh, as users uh, live stream and share uh, increasing volumes of video content or collaborate on the move or demand improved broadband performance wherever they are. Uh, so which are the ingredients? The ingredients uh, to achieve uh, this uh, result are the ones that I put in this slide. Uh, first of all, more RF channels. Uh, we can talk about carrier aggregation in downlink and in uplink. Then we have uh, uh, higher order modulation schemes, uh, 256 uh, QAM uh, in downlink and 64 in uplink, and more antennas. The, uh, I think, well-known uh, concept of uh, MIMO. Um, then, uh, if these are the, the technicalities, uh, we also need more spectrum. And so I will spend a few words on uh, uh, LAA uh, or uh, on the CBRS uh, band, uh, the 3.5 gigahertz. Um, in US, uh, there is an important initiative uh, uh, by FirstNet uh, on the 700 megahertz, for example, or other operators like uh, T-Mobile are, are going to use the, the B71, that is the 600 megahertz. So um, it's a mix of different aspects. Uh, all of them are uh, contributing in achieving the performance. So let's see uh, a bit more about it. First of all, this is uh, the, uh, the timing. Um, uh, all these features uh, um, that I presented have been introduced in the recent consecutive releases of the 3GPP standard, <clears throat> and we will see this uh, in a, better in a, in a later slide. In this graph, the intention is to show uh, the timeline in terms of real availability in the field <coughs> and real adoption. So uh, on, on the top, you see the, the timing of the recent releases, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the operators started to uh, implement in the field uh, features that uh, were already defined uh, before than that. So, for example, LTE Category 4, providing 150 megabits per second, uh, is already available in the market since a long time, as well as uh, uh, the so-called dual carrier aggregation. And uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, with the, the Category 9 and 11, we started to see the triple carrier aggregation, followed uh, recently. Uh, end of last year by uh, the aggregation of four different uh, channels. And uh, uh, then uh, with the LTE category 18, uh, we can arrive to five uh, uh, together with uh, LAA. And we will see in detail with what does it mean. Um, I talked about uh, uh, adoption. So let me show you uh, this uh, uh, chart that I have uh, extracted uh, uh, really yesterday from the latest uh, GSA uh, report, uh, so dated uh, May 2018. And you can see that uh, uh, in the field uh, there are already 295 uh, operators that are investing uh, at uh, uh, technology level in gigabit LTE. To be uh, precise, uh, this uh, number of operators is, uh, is uh, spread across 125 countries and they are investing at least in one of these uh, three major and key features that I just uh, listed. So the, the higher order modulation scheme or the MIMO or the carrier aggregation. Then if we look uh, at uh, not only at the investments but uh, the real deployments, uh, we have 41 operators that deployed uh, all the three technologies uh, services and uh, uh, 16 already. Uh, I remember that in February there were nine, so this means that uh, uh, the market is really evolving, that announced uh, the gigabit, uh, so or at least uh, close to it, uh, speeds uh, in their deployed uh, commercial networks. Uh, there are also, uh, I can tell you, four uh, operators that uh, uh, have uh, pockets of network capable of delivering the maximum uh, downlink speed supported by category 18. If you remember, I just mentioned the category 18 in the previous slide, uh, with uh, a peak theoretical throughput uh, up to uh, 1.2 gigabit per second. And uh, uh, expect many other networks to achieve the gigabit speed very soon, 
as they implement a new carrier aggregation combinations or a refarm or acquire new spectrum resources to aggregate their spectrum. I hope this is, uh, this is clear, so I would like just to uh, have one slide for each of these uh, functionalities and, and features. So when we talk about uh, uh, MIMO, we talk about multiple input and multiple output. Uh, the well-known schema a few years ago with the introduction of the first LTE devices also in the IoT space uh, was a scheme of two by two, so two antennas in transmission and two uh, in, on the receive side. Uh, now we, uh, we see uh, an increasing adoption of the four by four MIMO. Um, just to make it clear, this does not mean that uh, we are uh, multiplying by two the speed. Uh, MIMO is a feature to improve the spectral efficiency. That is a measure of how efficiently a limited frequency spectrum is uh, utilized uh, by the physical layer protocol to transmit the information. So um, to be really precise, a 4x4 is achieving uh, 1.8 times the spectral efficiency uh, compared to, to the scheme. I can also tell you that uh, higher order MIMO is also being used for trials, but the focus in the industry right now uh, is really on the 4x4 because it is becoming commercially available on devices uh, that you can buy, um, and we will see later a few examples. So uh, apart from the experiments and the trials in the field, this is really um, a technology at a reasonable cost that can be used without complicating too much uh, the architecture of the new devices that will anyway happen in the future, in particular with uh, uh, the arrival of 5G. This is uh, um, a slide for the uh, higher order modulation uh, evolution. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, self-explaining, at least for, for people in the in this business, uh, it in, basically it increases the number of bits that can be carried per symbol. And uh, okay, the trade-off uh, is that uh, this approach is more susceptible to noise. But uh, of course, uh, uh, when a system is uh, trying to achieve the best throughput, uh, there is always a, a trade-off between the combination of the three different technologies. So it is important to have uh, the ability, at least theoretically, to achieve the maximum that is possible. And then the network will be able to uh, downscale if, uh, if required. Um, before I talked about the carrier aggregation, and uh, um, this was uh, one of the three major ingredients in the in the recipe that uh, we have seen at the beginning. Uh, this is uh, a kind of a different type of uh, carrier aggregation, and uh, it is called licensed assisted access. And basically, it is a feature introduced in the 3GPP release 13, and it uses a carrier aggregation in the downlink, not in the uplink, downlink only to combine LTE in the unlicensed spectrum, uh, 5 gigahertz in terms of frequency, with LTE in the licensed band. This means that operators with as little one block of 20 megahertz, for example, of licensed spectrum can deploy gigabit class LTE. So it's another tool, another method to achieve uh, uh, the performance. And uh, uh, since we started to talk about um, spectrum, uh, let me uh, spend a few words also on this uh, important uh, uh, band, the C band that is uh, really a stepping stone uh, to, to 5G, but already uh, relevant now with 4G and with LTE gigabit. Uh, uh, it's a spectrum uh, uh, that spans from the band 42 uh, to the limit of the band 43. Uh, that are, by the way, uh, the, the bands uh, relevant in, uh, in Europe. Uh, in US, there is a slightly different uh, approach, uh, that is the CBRS, uh, that is combining uh, LTE and license spectrum with LTE in the license band. And, uh, uh, so we are talking about 3.5 gigahertz, more or less, 
that is providing uh, uh, those technical and economical answers to the increasing demand of spectrum and in turn uh, enable the economies of scale for the gigabit class uh, speeds that are becoming an instrumental factor for the 5G enhanced mobile broadband. So uh, we said before, okay, we need some features, but we need also the spectrum. And, uh, and uh, this spectrum is really important. And this is one of the ways in which uh, the uh, the MNOs are able to leverage the technicalities uh, by uh, increasing the spectrum uh, they have uh, available. And uh, I, I said that uh, in the uh, US we have a slightly different uh, approach. Um, well, uh, the CBRS is the, the so-called citizen broadband radio system, not to be confused with the citizen band uh, radio system. And, uh, Basically, this is a 150 megahertz broadband uh, broadcast band, sorry, that was used historically by the United States for uh, radar systems, and uh, uh, recently the FCC opened it for commercial user. This means that uh, it is uh, possible to exploit uh, the 3.5 gigahertz for IoT connectivity or even for Wi-Fi replacement, for example, and. Uh, uh, the spectrum is not uh, uh, sold in uh, in big uh, blocks, but is allocated by the SAS, uh, so servers that are allocating the spectrum based on a case by case uh, scenario. And this is really important uh, in US right now to provide uh, uh, a set of additional uh, services that the enterprises can leverage to deliver. Their, uh, their services indeed. So I mentioned before that I would have presented a slide uh, where I wanted to summarize how these features evolved uh, in the standard. So um, this is the summary. And uh, uh, let's see uh, how things happened. Uh, with the release eight and nine, we had already in in the recent past uh, the concept of carrier aggregation uh, with the uh, twenty megahertz channel and the concept of MIMO uh, two by two. And the, uh, in downlink, uh, the modulation scheme was up to sixty four. And uh, the speeds that you can read in this slide are hundred that basically corresponds to the LT category three. That is one of the first LD uh, category that the IoT ecosystem used. And then uh, 150, that uh, is uh, basically LT category 4. Then with the release 10 uh, and the so-called LT advanced, we started to see uh, uh, dual carrier aggregation and then triple carrier aggregation. So the speed started to double or to triple up to uh, 600 megabit per second and uh, a major milestone is the LTE Advanced Pro. So with the uh, release uh, 13 that has been frozen in the 2016, that is not famous only for being the, the start of narrowband IoT and category M1, but also an important uh, uh, 3GPP release for the definition of all the new features that you see listed in the, in the blue box and that are uh, exactly the, the ones that we just uh, described. Actually, the 256 uh, QAM uh, was already defined in release 12, if I'm not wrong. But anyway, it's a cumulative uh, work item. And starting from this release, uh, we can theoretically achieve uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 1.2 gigabit per second uh, target. Um, so the LT Advanced Pro uh, leadership is key to success uh, in the 5G era. Uh, we will have, of course, uh, after that uh, 5G that will come uh, with uh, millimeter wave communication or in parallel also with the sub uh, 6 gigahertz communication, but it won't be a replacement. Uh, there will be a coexistence of 5G new radio with the 4G uh, core network. Uh, with the LT gigabit uh, essential in providing uh, ubiquitous coverage and services. Uh, as we said before as well. I was uh, mentioning uh, um, 
how uh, some of these uh, um, new features and uh, the uh, the new spectrum, for example, with the adoption of CBRS, uh, could have an impact uh, on uh, the enterprise networking and on the services that service providers can offer or that the enterprises itself can, can leverage. And um, this is an example. This is an example of uh, uh, how this can be achieved. Uh, and uh, basically it refers to the uh, SD1, so the software defined network that are important to decrease the complexity of the traditional uh, uh, wireless area network. Um, wireless in general is, is cheaper than, than wired and more flexible and with this new concept uh, it is possible to route uh, traffic uh, based on usage uh, and it is possible to optimize the performance and, uh, and reducing the downtime uh, period. So you see from the graph that there are still, of course, uh, some uh, uh, wired uh, connections, but then uh, uh, all the distributed uh, uh, offices uh, or stores uh, and equipment in general of an enterprise uh, uh, network uh, can be connected uh, via um, uh, LTE 4G and in particular with LTE gigabit and all these uh, routers and gateways are already today uh, implementing technologies that are capable of reaching 600 megabit per second and uh, uh, as uh, we have seen uh, there are already networks capable to support uh, uh, the, the, the one gigabit and more to come. So after this uh, uh, introduction uh, that was a bit uh, theoretical uh, but at least uh, uh, important to uh, to tell you which are the, the tools uh, and, and the technical possibilities to achieve these results let me show you also a criteria uh, for uh, for selecting devices in this case from from us from Telit uh, that uh, will allow your applications to uh, achieve uh, those uh, performances. Um, I also take the opportunity to uh, remember one of the answers that we have seen before in the poll question. There are still um, companies that are not interested in upgrading to such a, a high data rate. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the part of our portfolio that we call uh, the, the broadband portfolio uh, that you can see here uh, is uh, still uh, um, featuring devices that are LT category 4. So remember a few slides before I was talking about uh, the 150 megabit per second in downlink and 50 in uplink. This is the case uh, with the, the mini PCIe that you see on the left. Or uh, for example with the LGA device that you see on the right hand side of the picture that is uh, a category 6. Uh, but since we are in a webinar talking about uh, uh, LTE gigabit, uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, stress the attention on the uh, category 11, that is the 600 megabit per second that we are able to offer uh, today. And the recent announcement of the LM960, that is a category 18. So uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, you have seen how the technological evolution happened and uh, uh, this is reflected in our offering. If there are already today networks that are capable of supporting uh, this uh, um, speed, we also want to offer this capability uh, to our customers with one of our products. Uh, this is also another mini PCA form factor because we believe that this kind of data card is still uh, uh, relevant uh, in the industry. And in the specific case, it is based on a uh, Qualcomm uh, uh, platform, the, the X20. In particular, if we uh, focus on the uh, high level features of these devices, uh, this is the CAT 11. But anyway, these are information that are also available in our website. And uh, what is important to mention is that this product is a global product. So we have a, a variety of uh, supported uh, frequency bands that will allow you to deploy basically everywhere in the world. Of course, there are differences that I will uh, describe later on. But 
still we can uh, consider it as a global product without the need of different SKUs to uh, deploy in different regions. And uh, uh, once again, uh, it is category 11. That means uh, 600 megabit. It means that this is a product supporting the triple carrier aggregation of channels of 20 megahertz and uh, the 256 QAM. This is product that is available right now. This is the brand new instead, uh, that is the 960. And it is our flagship in terms of uh, performance because it is the first device in our offering that is uh, breaking the uh, barrier of the gigabit. So um, it is uh, theoretically able to uh, support uh, five uh, carrier aggregations. Um, and uh, also in this case is a global product with even more bands than the previous one. Uh, we mentioned before uh, bands like, uh, uh, for example, band 14 or band 71 uh, or band 42 or 43, so the, the CBRS bands, and uh, they are all included in this, uh, in this product. So I think it's relevant to mention. And this is uh, available in samples and uh, will be available in mass production uh, by Q3. This is a way to, uh, to see uh, the major uh, features uh, uh, in one shot. And I think that the, the most evident uh, difference, uh, if we want to repeat once again, uh, which are the uh, features that are allowing you to achieve the performance. Um, you see, if you see the first two columns, I didn't talk about the LN940, but it is another cut 11 or 9, uh, depending on the software configuration on a different form factor, that is the M.2, but basically for the rest is, uh, is the same device. And you can see how the MIMO, in this case, is a 4 by 2 It's not a 4 by 4 The carrier aggregation is a 3 uh, three, um, 3 by And uh, um, instead, uh, the 960, apart from uh, the band configuration that I just mentioned, is uh, uh, up to 4 by 4 MIMO and uh, 5 carrier aggregation. So let me uh, close the loop uh, with uh, uh, what we have uh, uh, said uh, at the beginning of, the, of this webinar, since we are heading towards the end, and this is my final slide. Uh, as I said, I, I would like to close the loop. Uh, you might remember that uh, in the introduction, I, uh, I mentioned the 5G technologies, uh, and then the chipset adoption that is enabling uh, uh, the current portfolio to break the barrier of the gigabit. Uh, the fact that 5G is not there yet, uh, but it will come in the next future. And um, the fact that in terms of uh, uh, experience, the gigabit uh, is uh, there now. Uh, but if we want to look for a real 5G, we have to look at the next year. Uh, I promised you before that we would have discussed about timing. And as you can see from, uh, from this uh, announcement, uh, again, this is Qualcomm. Uh, they introduced their first real 5G architecture, and we are one of the um, uh, companies that will support the technology uh, to enable those customers that uh, at the beginning of this presentation declared to be waiting for 5G. So this will happen for sure and it will be part of our portfolio as well. So I hope to have given you uh, the uh, opportunity to see what is available today in terms of features in the field by the operators defined by the standards and what is available from a product perspective and what will come uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as I said, uh, there, is no, um, there is an overlap uh, there is not a replacement. We don't have to think about 5G as a complete disruptive uh, uh, technology that will cancel everything we are doing right now with 4G. No, this is not the case. Uh, the technology is designed exactly to coexist. Uh, as I said before, the 5G new radio will coexist with the 4G network. And uh, uh, this will happen to all the applications that we are designing together with you right now, both on the high end, uh, gigabit speed, for example, uh, if we remain in the context of this uh, webinar, or also 
as I also mentioned, uh, on the low end side uh, with CATM1 and narrowband IoT that are paving the way to the 5G IoT in the future, even if uh, the low end side of the IoT will be part of 5G in a second phase. Definitely the first part of 5G will be to fulfill uh, the use cases of uh, broadband uh, connectivity. And uh, uh, with, that, uh, with this final comment, uh, I finish my presentation. I hope to be on time uh, for, for some uh, questions, if uh, I will be able to answer them. Thank you, Marco, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we do have some questions in, and please feel free, if you have a question, fill it into your uh, Q&A box, and, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, to start us off, maybe we can ask this question. Um, what do you think will happen with IoT modules when we start seeing 5G new radio rollouts? Will we be looking at LTE CAT 18 to CAT 20 uh, multi-mode with 5G NR, or single-mode modules only, or 4G fallback, or, or what? Um, well, I hope to have understood uh, the question properly. I think that uh, uh, the the question is about which kind of configuration and which kind of LTE categories uh, we would uh, have to expect from new devices uh, uh, once 5G will be there. Uh, well, as I just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, there is no uh, real conflict. Uh, between the different uh, technologies. Therefore, um, if uh, an integrator uh, designs today an LTE category 18 device uh, with the specs that, for example, you have seen on the LM960, uh, once the 5G new radio uh, will be deployed uh, in the same region where the device is uh, supposed to operate, uh, the, uh, there will be no need to change the, the design of today. Uh, it will continue to operate, uh, and, uh, and there will be no um, backward compatibility issue, uh, if this is the question. Then, uh, for the new technologies, uh, of course, uh, it will depend uh, on uh, the architecture that, from a silicon uh, point of view, uh, it will be available in the market. Uh, I mentioned, for example, one solution that uh, one of the leaders in the industry is uh, announcing, but it will be not the only one, of course. Uh, someone else will um, will present uh, uh, their solutions as well, and, and this will have an impact uh, on the uh, choices of the, uh, of the integrators at the end. And uh, we are here to help uh, in the selection because uh, uh, it's our interest that our customers are going uh, to a good product uh, that is fulfilling their requirements, not just uh, following the trends uh, or following the, the press releases or, or just uh, the, the, the gut feeling of the people that are excited by a new technology or by a new hype. Uh, there is always a good timing to deploy a product uh, with a given uh, a specification, and uh, we are here also as a, as a trusted uh, uh, advisor to, to give you a suggestion on which is the right time to, to go, depending on, on your needs. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, do you see LTE CAT 20, um, two gigabytes per second roll, uh, being rolled out broadly before 5G NR, or will it be skipped completely? Ah, uh, good question. I uh, I could say that I don't have <laughs> the crystal ball, uh, but um, if I have to, to give a serious answer, um, let me say that uh, uh, it happened uh, also in the recent past that uh, an LTE category has been defined uh, but never used. And uh, I have in mind, uh, for example, the LTE category zero. If we look on the other side at the low end, uh, a part of the specification, and uh, uh, this could happen, uh, in particular if uh, uh, the operators are pushing the market uh, towards uh, the next step. Uh, in the case of uh, um, K20, 
CAT20, uh, well, uh, I'm aware of uh, new solutions that are already capable of supporting the 2 gigabit per second, uh, so I would say that uh, there will be the possibility to leverage these, uh, these solutions. Uh, but more important, uh, uh, I would say that uh, we have uh, sometimes uh, to uh, differentiate uh, the LT categories and the 3GPP release by the, uh, from the uh, actual features that uh, the networks are implementing. It could be that uh, um, a, a release uh, 13 uh, uh, network, uh, so compatible with DLT Advanced Pro uh, specification, is not going to be upgraded fully to release uh, uh, 14, for example, but just implementing a few of the required features to achieve uh, uh, the, uh, the results and, and, and to fulfill the requirements of the, of the customers, of the, of the users, or of the operator itself. So uh, sometimes we, we don't have to be really uh, close to the definition. It could be uh, a trade-off between uh, uh, the specs defined in a release uh, and, and the other, and then the devices accordingly will support what is really required by the market. Okay. Um, is Telet ready to support uh, first net applications with any product? Yes, we are. Um, uh, maybe I didn't stop enough uh, time on the on the specs of the product, but uh, if you remember at the real beginning, I was mentioning. Uh, uh, the uh, the need for more spectrum uh, and uh, uh, there was also a reference to uh, to band uh, 14 uh, so the 700 megahertz uh, uh, that is going to be used by by FirstNet uh, and uh, so the the ecosystem of the public safety and uh, uh, if you look at the frequency band supported by the LM960 uh, this band is there it is supported. So if we look at uh, the high performance, uh, this is a possible um, solution. But I can also tell you that we are working on uh, LT Cat1 or Cat4 solutions uh, supporting the same band, uh, because when we talk about public safety, uh, not as as we said several times during this webinar, there there is not one technology that fits uh, uh, all the possible use cases. So there could be also a simpler device uh, that is uh, uh, requiring just 10 megabit per second in downlink and 5 in uplink, uh, uh, for which uh, an LT category 1 um, is, uh, is more than enough, uh, but it's important to support uh, the new spectrum, and this is what we are designing. OK, um, thank you. So let's see, here's another uh, question. What is the difference between MPLS and SD-WAN, and what is the advantage of each in terms of deploying LTE? Um, let's say that uh, as far as I um, know, um, the real advantage is the, um, the flexibility. Uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, and also the performance, because uh, uh, the um, uh, MPLS uh, uh, risk uh, to be slow, uh, too slow for supporting the uh, required performance of a, of a new enterprise network in the scheme that I uh, described. Uh, while uh, the um, the SD1, uh, uh, first of all, gives the flexibility to allocate the resources. Uh, as they are required uh, at the right time, uh, at the right place. So uh, it's not a fixed configuration. It's, it's something that, uh, because it's software defined, uh, really can, can provide this, uh, this advantage. OK. Um, and, uh, one question here. Perhaps you can comment on um, UICC support for, um, for this? Uh, is the is the question asking just that? Yes, okay, I can read it. Um, well, um, EUICC is uh, definitely a trending topic uh, in the industry right now, 
and uh, uh, also in this case we have uh, to be careful when we talk about the UICC <clears throat> and not to confuse or not to mix the, the meaning. Um, we can uh, talk about uh, eSIM and the possibility to embed uh, a solderable uh, SIM chip uh, into the uh, board of the, of the IoT device, and we can talk about EUICC. That means uh, all the possibilities to uh, provide uh, features like uh, remote uh, uh, subscription management. Uh, that is exactly the, 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 the scope of the UICC. And uh, all the TELIT uh, uh, devices uh, are able to support uh, uh, the UICC. It's a matter of uh, supporting the BIP protocol uh, and the SIM toolkit. Uh, so uh, then we can we can talk about uh, uh, a UICC that is on the board of the customer, or in sometimes uh, if we have enough space, uh, a UICC that can be embedded in our device. So it depends on the selection of the product and, and which are the needs of the, of the customer. But yes, the the answer is definitely um, positive. Uh, then we have uh, also um, another offering that is called uh, uh, SimWise. Uh, but for those that are interested, uh, I would suggest to have uh, a a dedicated follow-up uh, offline uh, because this is, this is not part of this uh, of this webinar, so I don't want to to, to steal time uh, from from other potential questions on on this LT gigabit. Okay, good. Um, here's a, uh, another question: If if millimeter wave 5G has to coexist with sub six gigahertz, would millimeter wave um, have a separate transceiver and modems, or the modem will be a common one? Uh, from, a, from a modem uh, perspective, um, I'm not an uh, NRF uh, engineer, but I'm pretty sure that uh, what we will offer is, uh, is a unique one. Uh, but uh, um, for sure, what I've been told uh, by by our engineers and also reading the specifications is that uh, uh, millimeter wave is really uh, uh, increasing the complexity of the RF front end. Uh, and uh, if today we have talked about uh, uh, MIMO uh, 4x4, uh, actually the number of antenna elements uh, into a 5G millimeter wave device uh, will be uh, definitely uh, more uh, important uh, in terms of numbers and the complexity of the design also will uh, will increase. Uh, this is why I also said that uh, for the time being we can focus on the LTE gigabit uh, and the configuration of MIMO 4x4 and there is time to digest uh, the complexity that will come uh, with uh, these more advanced uh, uh, solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, Will um, 5G narrowband be better than NB-IoT or EC-GSM for current um, LPWA uh, application? And if it is, then how much cost reduction will be there for 5G narrowband um, IoT modules compared to NB-IoT modules? Uh, well, uh, better. Uh, for sure, the technologies uh, uh, are um, depending on the definition of new standards. And uh, as I said before, the standards are a cumulative work item. So uh, if uh, narrowband IoT has been defined in uh, the release 13, we already know that uh, in the release 14 uh, there are some improvements. Here, um, then we can question if those improvements are uh, required or not. Uh, for sure, if they have been defined, uh, it means that uh, for someone they are important. Uh, but there could be applications that are uh, more than happy with uh, what they have defined uh, in uh, uh, release 13. But uh, yes, the, the improvement uh, will, uh, will happen. 
and will will not stop with release 14. Uh, release 15 uh, is the first uh, to really touch base on uh, on the official 5G work items. And as I said, uh, uh, both CATM1 and Neuroband are the candidate to uh, to be submitted uh, to meet uh, the, the requirements of the 2020. Uh, uh, definition, uh, so yes, uh, there will be uh, an improvement for sure. Uh, then we have to discuss uh, if this improvement is, uh, is required by the application or not. Um, the question is referring to ECGSM. Um, let me say that uh, uh, ECGSM uh, is probably the only one that is not really getting traction in the LPWA ecosystem. There is only one major operator, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is uh, keeping this technology um, uh, in their radar. But uh, all the others have uh, focused on uh, or CATM1 or narrowband IoT, and in most of the cases in both of them, uh, simply with different uh, priorities. Uh, but I would not bet. Let, let, at least not today. As I said before, I don't have the crystal ball, but as of today, I would not bet on ECGSM. I would rather um, uh, bet on relevant uh, improvements of category M1 and Urband uh, in the next couple of years instead. If we want to talk about uh, cost, uh, I'm not able to give an answer, but uh, definitely uh, those technologies uh, have been defined uh, uh, also to to uh, decrease the complexity of the architecture and to allow a, a better uh, cost positioning. So uh, the more uh, devices we will see in the market, the more economy of scale we will be able to leverage and the more advantage for the uh, end user we will have. Uh, but this is an obvious statement uh, uh, that I'm making right now uh, and, uh, and the idea is really to, to go uh, uh, to go better in the, in the next future. These are changes that are not happening uh, in one year. Um, every time that I get a question about price and comparison with GSM, for example, uh, I always try to remember uh, to the people that uh, it took uh, 10 years to arrive to the GSM prices of today uh, and how many millions of devices we have deployed of, uh, of GSM. So uh, we are uh, at the beginning of a new era, uh, definitely. Uh, it's also in our interest to, to provide better products at a better price to our customers, but we have to set the expectation, this is for sure. Thank you. And uh, what was the motivation for selecting MPCIE uh, for most of your products instead of uh, M2? Uh, this is a good question. Um, actually, at the beginning, uh, <clears throat> we um, decided uh, uh, to go uh, for uh, mini PCIe uh, with uh, the entry-level product uh, um, uh, using uh, our um, LT Category 4 uh, modules. Uh, uh, on top of uh, a uh, data card, an adapter with this form factor. Um, and in parallel, we uh, offered uh, to the market the M.2, but in particular for the mobile computing uh, market, because this was the, as the name, the first name was uh, uh, defining the, the NGFF, so the, the next generation form factor. Um, and uh, at the same time, we realized that uh, this next generation didn't mean uh, that uh, the mini PCIe was dead, not at all. Uh, the industry is full of uh, devices uh, that, for example, were designed uh, not to uh, host cellular connectivity at all, but they have uh, a, an available uh, slot for mini PCIe. So, why not uh, supporting uh, these kind of products uh, and uh, extending the life of those devices, uh, uh, adding uh, cellular connectivity even even where it was not uh, initially uh, thought. Um, so um, the choice is really because we see traction is still uh, is still a good um, a good product, a good form factor, and. Uh, 
uh, if we want to look at the technicalities, uh, being uh, slightly bigger than the M.2, it is also allowing uh, more complex architecture and supporting all the frequency bands uh, that you have seen uh, in the products that I presented. The more small you go, the more complex it is to, uh, to, to condense and put all the, the components that are required, uh, and maybe more sophisticated solutions are required. That means uh, more, uh, more cost. Uh, but uh, with mini PCIe, uh, it's, it's definitely easier to design. And uh, uh, if a router or a gateway uh, uh, as, a, as an available space, uh, for sure the space uh, is there for a mini PCA, not just for an M.2 that uh, uh, was uh, probably more designed for the mobile computing, so to be inside our laptop or, or small devices. Okay, I, I hope that I was able to answer at least. Uh, those questions, thank you, thank you, if there are Mark. others, of course, I will, I will be able to answer offline if we run out of time now. Yes, we, we are at, at the top of the hour. Thank you, Marco, um, on behalf of the IMC, and uh, we want to thank our audience as well for joining us today. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be available in the next 24 hours on our website, iotmtmcouncil.org. You will also receive a post-event email, which will include information on um, the on-demand viewing of this uh, event. So thank you, everyone.